Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, today we have Alicia Campbell. It, uh, she is the founder and principal of Culture Shift HR, and she will be speaking on diversity, equity, and inclusion, a methodology for successful implementation and cultural change. Alicia is an accomplished and respected strategic HR leader with a decade of experience that encompasses all facets of human resource management, from executing successful multi-million dollar workforce recruitment and optimization projects to spearheading employee culture initiatives. Her passion for the industry has led her to start her own agency, Culture Shift HR. As founder and principal, Alicia helps companies utilize and engage their best talent, while creating purposeful work environments that help businesses grow and thrive. Thank you every, everyone again for joining us and Alicia, good luck on your presentation. Wonderful, well, thank you so much for having me. I am super excited to be here um, and I know we don't, so we're gonna get straight into it. So as an agenda, we're going to talk about an overview of the methodology for success, successful DNI strategy. Um, we're going to go through the diversity and inclusion maturity matrix, which is very pivotal and key in understanding your DNI strategy. We're going to talk about the harmony of D, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, the roadmap for a successful DNI strategy, breaking down the journey and beginning it, and then we're going to go into some questions and comments. So in this session, we will explore the fundamentals of a successful DNI culture, the roadblocks and challenges that prevent success. We will dive into how to identify goals for your DNI strategy and to format them into an action plan to start creating and measuring effective change. We're going to talk about the importance of having equitable policies and programs as the background of your DNI framework and identifying opportunities for DNI and HR in building your roadmap for a successful strategy of growth. So with any DNI session, I always start here. And my overall thought with this graph is starting with the end in mind. And when I talk to a lot of clients about diversity, equity, and inclusion, it's a very overwhelming subject and they like to boil the ocean, so to say. And so this photo really just outlines very clearly that there's different levels and different maturities to your diversity, equity, and inclusion um, program and to your journey. And so with that, you'll see at level one, it's very basic. You're, you're really just focusing on defining what diversity, equity, inclusion means for your organization, putting some plans around what you want this to look like, and more so operating it from a very regulatory perspective. And then fast forward to level five, is sustainability, where we have DNI as being the core of your culture and outlining it to the point of this is how things are done. This is no longer just an element that sits within the HR team. This is a part of your business model. This is the usual day-to-day. -day. It's embedded in policies, practices, procedures. And at this point, it literally becomes your key competitive advantage. So I say that to say, when you're starting your diversity, equity, and inclusion journey, take a step back. Realize that there is levels to this, that there is definitely a journey you are undertaking, and to not put so much pressure on yourself to go from zero to 100 overnight. But there is a lot that you can do within a year, two, three, five year plan that can be impactful and still make meaningful change. So why do DNI strategies fall short? Firstly, there's a lack of understanding of the problem that manifests in creating non-inclusive, non-diversive workplaces. Leaders are not taking the time to really understand the true problem and how that problem can show itself in various elements of your business, from profitability to employee engagement, from performance management. There are multiple layers to your DNI strategy, and just uh, putting a blanket statement over all the problems is not going to get the solution you need. You need to be focused. There's a lack of recent and historical information. You've never counted data before. You never looked at data before. So you don't have any baseline. There's no substantiated objective or plan. Just this is what we need to do mentality. So again, it's just rushing to the finish line without thinking and being methodical on what we really actually need to do and why we're actually doing it. We rely too much on our diverse employees to do a lot of the work, which happens in a lot of organizations. They, we go to them to say, create your DNI strategy, create a plan, create training. And you have to remember, these are your employees that are come to do a specific job. So when you then put the additional work of asking them to now carry out a DNI strategy, you have to realize the magnitude and the weight of what, of what you're asking them. 
There's a lack of executive buy-in and support, lack of um, subject matter expertise supporting counsel, which then makes the work that much more harder to lift off and be sustainable. And more effort, work, and time than initially anticipated and efforts are not sustainable. I always say that within your DEI journey, it is a marathon, not a race. So it's so important that you take the time, understand what you're doing and the timeline it's going to take to get it done correctly. I always love to show this Venn diagram for several reasons. Number one, it really outlines the key elements of diversity, equity, inclusion, what they mean, and what your culture is going to look like when one or the other is out of sync. And, my, and other than that, I also love how when everything comes together so harmoniously, you have a great culture of belonging. And I love this picture because it really outlines what you're trying to achieve at the end of the day. When you're looking to create a culture of belonging, you need diversity, equity, and inclusion at the core of it. And you'll see here that when one dominates the other, you have different elements in your culture that start to rear up its ugly head, which starts to then create and shift this culture of belonging that you're trying to um, cultivate within your workplace, especially now virtually. So it's so important to understand, take this away and understand how every layer is so important. You can't have the diversity without the equity and inclusion. You can't have the inclusion without the equity and diversity. And they all play such an important part into your roadmap. But know this, that no matter where you are in your DNI journey, this picture is achievable and it is sustainable. And you are able to get here with taking just a few key steps and building on those years. So I, how can DNI transform your organization? And so we've seen tons of stats. We've seen lots of stories of how DEI can truly become a competitive advantage. But let's look at that a little bit deeper. So the combination of employee engagement and gender diversity results in 46 to 58 percent higher financial performance for business units with above average engagement and gender diversity. Companies are pointing the highest level of racial diversity in their organization, bringing 15 times more sales revenue than those with the lowest levels of racial diversity. Companies that have more diverse management teams have 19% higher revenue due to um, innovation. Profits increase up to 50% as the share of women increases. Research has shown that diverse teams, when making a business decision, outperform individual decision makers up to 87% of the time. And for every 10% increase in racial and ethnic diversity on the senior executive team, earnings before interest in tax raise 0.8%. And studies have found that belonging can lead to an estimated 56% increase in job performance, reduction in turnover, uh, risk by 50%, and 75% decrease in employee sick days. This, these statistics are powerful. This can literally take your business from middle of the line to absolutely competitor status once you have a roadmap in place. The numbers speak for themselves. And so there's no more longer the question of why. We now need to be thinking of how. How can we start to in, in, incorporate this type of transformation? How can we start to really live and breathe the DNI so that we can start to see the results? So a successful DNI culture is really broken down into four key areas. So breaking down bias, creating a goals and action plan, creating equitable workplace policies and programs, and looking at DNI beyond HR. So let's go through breaking down bias. So in a reality, bias is really a cognitive shortcut that allows our brains to make decisions faster for efficiency. So think about it. Imagine every time you had to go home, you had to look at a map to figure out directions. That would be a nightmare. So our brains automatically, just by the way our brains are, create these cognitive shortcuts, which create a bias. -y, a bias. So for example, us going right instead of left to go home down the street, that is a bias. Unconscious bias or implicit biases really are the underlying attitudes and stereotypes that people unconsciously attribute to another person or group that affect how they understand and engage with that group. And what we need to do with that, knowing that biases are an, are an inherent part of our human function, are an inherent part of our, of our functionality as a human being, we need to understand and know where the line is between a bias that is helpful and a, bio that, and a bias that can be very dangerous. So we need to be aware that biases exist, then while also keeping our negative prejudice 
biases in check because it requires a very delicate balance to understand. And when you have that implicit bias, when you have thoughts or judgments towards a racial group that are not justified on any facts or any being, that's when you start to get into very dangerous territory. Um, and those really become the breeding ground for more prejudiced behavior um, and language down the line. So what causes bias? How do we get bias in the first place? So we create bias at a very young age, and it's actually an inherent part of our learning and development as we continue to understand the world around us. Um, as we know, our brains are constantly developing when we're young children, and so we get influenced by our surroundings, our relationships, media we consume, things that we see, and that all starts to go into our brains and starts to make biases because our bias at the end of the day was made for shortcuts. And the reasons we have shortcuts is a way for our brain to protect how we navigate to ensure that we are able to survive longer. That's the whole purpose of our brain. It's to make sure that we are in optimal mode of survival. So these shortcuts are, are supposed to make sure that we make decisions quickly, effectively, so that we can move on from any risk or danger that can be um, happening to us at that time. But what we need to be aware of is that we are not in danger 24 seven as our brains may think or may create and wire the way that we that we that we might be once upon a time ago. So we need to understand that we didn't just wake up and not have bias and we were purposely trying to have bias. It's inherent in us through the upbringing that we've had. So what we need to now do is now reverse those those hands of time, be aware of our biases and by learning and training and starting to be aware of the impact of those biases and no longer do those anymore. When we are aware of our biases, we can have in groups, out groups, and we can really start to create a us versus them mentality, which again can be very, very negative and leads to more prejudiced behaviors and language if we are not aware of them. There are over a hundred different biases um, that we can have um, at any given time. Of course, I will not go through this in explicit detail, but you can see that our brains have a lot of biases, um, and in, and it's very in, 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 and they come in various forms. But they all come with how we perceive information based on what our circumstances or previous historical data or situations have taught us. So a, key, a few key ones that I want to highlight, given the um, elements of HR, recruiting, jobs, because it's so important that we be aware of these things, because if we're not aware, we cannot make the changes to move forward. So number one, affinity bias. This is where we have a tendency to connect with others who share similar interests, experiences, and backgrounds. So if I meet somebody who went to the same school as me, I will most likely have more of an affinity towards them because I'll be able to relate to them on that level. We then have the halo effect, which is a tendency people have to place another person on a pedestal after learning something impressive about them. So say I realized someone started their own business and within the first year they generated six figure revenue. That's pretty impressive. So I'm going to have that person on a pedestal higher than someone who maybe hasn't been that far along their journey, as an example. We then have the horns effect, which is the opposite of the halo effect, where we see someone negatively based on something that they've said. Then, of course, we have gender and race bias, which is very, um, very uh, systematic in various infrastructures. And then we have name bias as well, where we can judge people um, unknowingly based on the name or the origins of their name. And so these are the types of biases that we see um, or not see that we interact with throughout our day to day. And again, that's why it's important to understand and, um, and know what bias looks like so we can catch it, reverse it, and hopefully not continue to do it again. So do I have bias and is it bad? Yes, we all have biases in various aspects of our life. That's really the bottom line. And as mentioned, it's human nature to assign judgment based on first assumptions because it's a survival tactic, fight or flight. Um, but what's key about biases is that when we rely on biases, we start to lose accuracy and we lose correctness. So for example, if we worked in a factory and there's a conveyor belt with bottle caps and, we, and our job is to count the bottle caps every hour, over time, you know, maybe in the beginning we'll count cap by cap by cap, but over time we'll say, okay, based on the speed of the conveyor belt, the amount of um, bottle caps on average that are on the belt at any given time, 
I can assume 600 you know, bottle caps go by in any given hour. But say they increase the number of bottle caps or they speed up the conveyor belt and they don't tell us, we're now assuming that that number is going to stay stagnant without realizing various factors, without realizing more information. So it's so important that although biases help us make decisions faster, they don't allow us to be correct and they lose accuracy if they are not based on fundamental truths. So it's so important that we understand that biases, although our brain has created them to help us make decisions faster, they are not inherently good for us. So how do we manage our bias? How do we make sure that we're understanding and really taking that time to overcome bias in ourselves? Number one, introspection. Um, we need to make sure that we explore and identify our own prejudices by taking a bias tests or other means of self-analysis so we can understand what bias we all truly have. Number two, we need to be mindful, mindfulness. We are more likely to give into a bias when we're under pressure. So let's practice ways to reduce stress, increase mindfulness, and focus on breathing. Perspective taking. Consider experiences from, from the point of view of a person being stereotyped. You can do this by reading or watching content that discusses how these experiences um, or interacting with various people. Learn to slow down. Before interacting with people from certain groups, pause and reflect to reduce reflexive actions. Consider positive examples of people from the stereotyped group so that you have positive influences. Individualization. Evaluate people based on their personal characteristics rather than those affiliated groups. This can include connecting over shared interests. Check your messaging. As opposed to saying, like, we don't see things in color, use statements that welcome and embrace multiculturalism or other differences. Institutionalized fairness, support a culture of diversity and inclusion at the organizational level. And lastly, take two, resist implicit bias is a lifelong work. You have to constantly restart the process and look at new ways to improve. And if you see here on the left-hand side, this methodology actually spells out implicit. Um, so if you're looking for a way to remember, you know, how are the ways that I can manage my bias, just remember implicit and hopefully some of these words will come back to mind. So now that we understand that it really all starts with bias, we need to now start to create and identify goals and an action plan. So areas in an organization that you can have DNI goals, you can have them in hiring, employee engagement, promotions and growth, recruitment, social impact, client onboarding, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. You can have goals with, regarding DNI in various elements of your business. But for the focus of today, this is just some of the key ones where when we're starting that we can start to um, make that right, that right step forward. So what does that look like? For hiring, for example, we could make a goal that says increase hiring rates for full-time engineering roles to 30% female engineers. Or employee engagement, women in underrepresented groups um, engagement in the organization remains 60% or higher. Recruitment, having eight to 10% of the applicants in every round be women or a minority. Social impact, donating 10% of profits to an LGBT community group to help individuals get work in tech. Or client onboarding, 20% of client growth, growth will come from Black, BIPOC, or women-owned or operated organizations. So when you really start to focus in on where you want to have the impact, you can then start to figure out what goals do we want to set. Now, are you going to hit that target? Hopefully you do, but there's a chance you may not, but that is okay. We have to start to set the bar somewhere so that we could start to make the right actions towards those changes. So how do we start to identify those goals? How do we start to identify what areas we want to focus in on the organization? And how do we start to make sure that we set those goals up for success? So number one, identify your ideal outcome. So are we trying to get more diversity into the pipeline? Are we trying to get more less biases in our processes? Are we trying to create a culture of inclusion and belonging? What is it that we want to do? And remember, let's not boil the ocean. Let's just focus on one thing and let's do that thing really, really well and then build on it. Because what we don't want to do is take too much on. We don't do it all the way. And then our employees get disappointed in the efforts that the organization is trying to make. So it's so important that we have to remember, this is a very personalized experience for our employees. This, these types of conversations, these types of actions go very, very deep for some individuals. So we need to respect that. And we need to make sure that we do not make light of any of these types of changes because they could have further repercussions.
You want to next make sure you understand your resources and restrictions. What resources do you have? Budget, people, time. There's a lot of things that need to get done in a year in the business on its own. So what resources do I have to create a DNI committee? Who's going to be my subject matter expertise to ensure that we're doing these the right way and we're focusing with our right people at the core of the solution? And the next sustainability and growth. What measures will we put in place to ensure the work continues to get done and continues to grow? How do we continue to educate and build upon what we're doing? What are we measuring and how? So by asking you and the team these types of questions, you're really starting to set the foundation for your roadmap because based on the answers you select, you're then gonna to start to identify those action items that are going to line to the identification of your goals. And I always say it's smarter to start small and build than having then starting off too big and then having to scale back because again whatever types of actions and goals you set you want to try to be as successful as possible so if this is your first time creating a dni roadmap or strategy you want to make sure that you're very aware of the limitations the resources so you set yourself up and the team for success as best as possible Let's take a quick example. So say we want to look at pay equity across the business. So the ideal outcome, ensure men, women, minority, and non-gender employees are being paid the same wage for the same work. Unless there is considerable experience difference that is quantifiable and reasonable enough to justify a pay difference, pay should be equal. Okay, so we will know that we want every engineer to be paid the same, um, no matter um, what their background or, or gender or race. Um, we want to make sure that not only that, but they're paid to market standard or paid fairly as possible. So how do we start to do that? Let's create fixed pay bands per role based on level of seniority. So if I have a junior engineer, a mid-level, and a senior, we're going to have a pay band and everybody will get paid to the middle of the band based on based on their role. Let's have fixed negotiation negotiation standards when we're hiring new talent. We won't negotiate over X percentage based on the initial offer. Point blank period. Um, bonus calculations based on metrics with a transparent process to ensure that if, if we ever get pushed on why somebody's bonus is, is higher than somebody else, we have a very clear outline of what that is. And then when we look at sustainability, let's ensure our pay bands are market standards through our annual salary review process, and let's hire a payroll or compensation manager to manage and maintain the process itself as well, so that we're creating that transparency and that arm length transaction. So you can see here how based on the ideal outcome, we're starting to create goals and a plan of how we're going to achieve that overarching objective. Now, the steps that go into creating the pay plan, bans, um, having negotiation standards, creating bonus calculations, there's definitely lots of steps in, the, in between there as well that require a lot of different stakeholders. But it's important that we start to identify the how so we can break that down and start to create more tactical, task-oriented items. So foundations for an action plan. Once you have identified what changes to and how you're gonna measure that change, it's time to act. Um, time is a stealer of all things, so we need to make sure that we're being very vigilant with our time and that we're um, seizing the day, so they say, when it comes to the actions we wanna see. We need to take the resources that we've started to identify and put a project plan in place so that we can start to get that goal accomplished and put a timeline to it. It's also important that as we continue to do the work that we have progress updates for the employees so they are aware of the progress in the work um, themselves and they see what the business is doing behind the scenes. And remember, new initiatives usually take a little bit longer than anticipated, so you want to always add an additional two to three month buffer so that if there's any time delays um, or competing priorities, you have more time to get the work done. And then if you need additional support, ensure you bring in a specialist or consultants to get the help you need. Again, this is a very sensitive topic. You don't want to, you know, do your best effort and then it still falls short in terms of what your employees are expecting. So getting um, that support up front to at least help lay the foundation will go a long, long way. Next, equitable workplace policies and programs. So having policies to support your DNI strategy shows your employees are committed to change, equity, and inclusiveness for all. This can be your organizational uh, philosophy or mission, your people philosophy, your DNI equity and inclusion policy, respect in the workplace, code of contact. Uh, conduct and escalation process and protocol. So there's a lot of different policies you can have in this space. You want to make sure that it's not just HR writing this, but you have different stakeholders from the business giving thoughts, giving feedback, even the employees as well, because they are living and embodying these policies that you have in your organization. So it's important that you make sure that this is an inclusive process and that you're seeking their insight and input as well.
Um, having programs are key in keeping the infrastructure of your DNI initiatives alive and growing within your organization. And it's important that as many layers as possible are involved in these changes. What we don't want is these changes being done in a vacuum and then just saying to the organization, here you go. It's like, well, did you do a survey to find out where we want to see support? How are we going to be measuring what this looks like? Who is going to be our executive sponsor if we need support or if we need more help pushing an initiative? So you want to make sure that we're bringing the organization along for the journey, and that it's not just something that's done behind um, closed doors. Programs and policies really help to be the infrastructure to, to ensure you're keeping your goals on track, you're setting your KPIs and your DNI initiatives as a main focus for the organization. And what's really great about this as well is the programs really help to say, it takes a community to make a community. Let's involve as many people as we can. I know that it's seeming like, okay, the more people we involve, the slower, the slower things can be. But having a DNI council that just uh, maybe one representative from every key area of the business, having an executive sponsor to make sure that the, the executive leadership team has an eye on what's going on. So he, so critical, just to make sure that everybody has had an opportunity to weigh in. So what could be some fundamental programs for DNI success? Having that uh, DNI counselor committee, ongoing DNI training and development, maybe having that executive diversity council, um, uh, ERGs or affinity groups, or monthly DNI conversation circles. All these programs can be set up in a very simple and seamless way that really start to open up the conversation, that really brings along everybody for the journey, and really allows to get everybody on the same page on where the organization is trying to go within their um, DEI journey. So now we're going to look at the last part, DNI beyond HR. So when leaders and employees hear of DNI, everybody automatically thinks of HR. So we think about diversity, hiring, pay equity, training, and those are very key parts in creating that, um, you know, that, that culture of belonging and really setting the pace for diversity, equity, inclusion. But it does not need to stop there. DNI does not live within the four walls of HR. It is an organizational initiative, um, and for it to really be successful, it needs to be in the cultural fabric of the organization, and it needs to be activated through all different elements of the business business operations and the strategy. And again, this does not happen overnight. Starting with HR and then building it out into different areas of the business is how you want to approach this because again, it is a, it's like building a new muscle. You know, you go to the gym, you want to look good for the summer. You know that it's going to take two to three months of working out, eating right, getting good sleep, drinking lots of water. So there's a lot of different layers to this as it would be um, with other examples. And so understanding that and taking time and patience to get it right is going to be so key for your long-term success. So where else can we have DNI beyond HR? So let's look at a couple of examples. So we can have it within client sourcing and acquisition, operational processes, IT systems and programs, market research, procurement, customer relations. The list is really endless. So let's look at uh, uh, procurement. So say we're looking to um, work with different vendors and other operators. Maybe let's look to make sure that they have a diversity business model, or let's make sure that they're women owned or operated, or let's make sure that they have, um, you know, 30% of their leadership team is women, BIPOC, or non-gender. There's different ways that we can start to set the expectations as a company of who we want to interact with and who we want to do business with based on the standards and goals that we have set as an organization. Market research, for example, if you're looking to get some market research, you know, ask the organization that's doing your research, what is your census group? You know, what's their diversity? How many, you know, participants are Black, BIPOC, um, BAME, and other ethnicities or genders um, or ideologies that we want to make sure are incorporated within the, our research segments. So putting those standards in place in various elements of the of your business model, it, it takes some time to be comfortable with it because we want to make sure we're getting the best price, the most effective um, operating processes. But it, once you're used to operating in a DNI lens, you really start to see the opportunities to leverage it in so many other places of your business. And that's where you truly start to stand apart from your competitors in the marketplace. So here's an example um, for criteria for client sourcing and acquisition. So when you're looking at a new client to bring on, maybe these are some key questions you want to ask. What are your core values and how does your leadership exhibit them? 
What are your thoughts or stance on corporate social responsibility? Do you believe in creating this space for everyone to have an equal opportunity to win? And how have you done that? Um, what has been your people growth strategy over the, the past 12 months? So maybe looking at how many women or people of color are in middle, senior, and executive levels of leadership. How do they plan to diversify their employees in thought, race, gender, and socioeconomic status? So asking these types of thought-provoking questions really starts to outline to clients, well, one, you as an organization are very serious about this and that you start to see it as a very core value of your business model. But two, it starts to see that companies need to rise up and be operating on a different standard, on a different level. Um, and it really, that's where that competitive advantage really comes from because not only will your custom, your potential clients start to see this, but this will get around definitely in the market. You will start to see um, potential candidates wanting to work with you because of this. You will start to see you being a part of different conversations because of this. And so it's really important that we understand the weight and the gravity of these types of decisions, the, the types of uh, business operating model, because it can be in, immensely impactful and beneficial, um, not just for the obvious reasons of creating a more equitable, inclusive, and diverse workplace, but also to start to set the standard and the bar when it comes to what we expect our other uh, business partners to do as well. So closing thoughts, uh, creating an organizational culture of diversity, inclusion, and belonging is very achievable, but it is a marathon, not a race. Again, remember, we're not trying to boil the ocean. We're trying to pick one to two things that we feel we can deliver on and deliver on very well and build on that over time. Ensure you have the right resources, support, and time allocated for your d &I efforts because it's going to be extremely helpful in making those changes successful. Don't underestimate the power of transforming your organizational culture. Your employees will be more um, engaged, productive, and overall have a higher point of satisfaction. And growing your DEI muscle is exactly that. It's a muscle. It will take time, but the difficult conversations and expectations will get easier to understand and manage within the organization to the point it will be second nature. Thank you for your time. If you want to learn more, uh, more about myself um, or more about College of Shift HR and our work within diversity, equity, and inclusion, I do group coaching, webinars, panels, keynote talks, training, lunch, and learn. So please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, I can be reached on the various platforms as well as my email. Looking forward to connecting with more of you. And let's open the floor up for some questions and comments. Hello. Hi. Hi, can you hear me? I can. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much for your presentation. That was very, very informative. Thank you. Um, oh, wonderful. Um, uh, I saw that at the end there that you had some contact information. If you don't mind actually putting that in the chat. Um, yes. So uh, people can actually, um, you know, jot that down. Yep. I'll do that now. Yeah. Yeah, I think we have Leslie here who said that she's interested in reaching out. If you see that, yeah. Is there, so I guess maybe just as we close out the presentation, um, I know that you did sort of a little like, um, you know, a takeaway at the end there. Um, but again, if maybe you can go over just a couple of things that people can take away from your presentation today. Absolutely. So number one is really identify where you're at as an organization. So if you have no, you know, roadmap or DNI strategy at all, start to understand what is it that we want to achieve. So if we want to create just one thing, it doesn't have to be five different things, but say we want to increase uh, the diversity of our hiring pipeline, that is a major accomplishment. So then from there, what, by how much, 5%, 10%, what does that look like? And so once you're able to then have the goal in mind, then start to create the action plan that's going to get you to that goal. So what that could look like is looking at your hiring practices. How are you writing your job descriptions? What types of minority-based groups are you reaching out to to connect with for jobs? Um, how do you make sure that your, your your interviewing questions are equitable or that your interviewing panels, you know, have diversity in them? So those little steps can go a far, can go a long way to ensuring that you're taking the right approaches to increasing your hiring pipeline. Because without some type of metric or goal, we're not holding ourselves accountable to anything. So starting small may seem small, but those small in, um, actions can have major impact down the line. Perfect. Thank you. Is there anything else that you'd like to add before we, we end the session here? 
Uh, just thank you to everybody um, for, for for listening in. Please contact me if you have any questions, want additional support, or if there's anything else that I can help with. And it was a pleasure being here. Perfect. Thank you so much for speaking. No, thank you, Sandra. Thanks. Bye. Bye.